have just completed the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and then we took a couple of weeks to review the commandments of Jesus, and also um, we, took, uh, we took a week to look at um, what is truth. So we answered that question from John, I believe it's 1838, that Pilate had asked, what is truth? And we saw that we as Christians are all called not just to speak the truth, but to act according to truth. And that we are called to live in truth, and we are to never participate in a lie. And that's much more than simply speaking the truth. It's refusing to participate in a lie. And the world offers us so many opportunities to participate in a lie. We got down to some very practical examples of what that looks like to not participate in a lie. And we're going to be looking, as I was very coy the last few weeks and said, into an Old Testament book which shall not be named until the day, but it's short and it examines the character of godly men and of godly women. And that book is the book of Ruth. And we're going to be looking at that today. And I think I hear over here my wife coming in, whom I sent back when she was halfway to church to go back home and pick up my Bible and my notes for this sermon. So just in time, as she walks in, she'll hand me this. And sometimes we wait on the Lord. His timing is perfect. If you would, if you would, there she is, the hero of the day. <laughs> Ruth, if you could reach in there, grab my notes and my Bible, that would be most appreciated. What a cool thing, uh, being a married, a married person. I love it. Uh, we have different roles, and we compliment each other, not just to say, like, you're doing a great job, compliment. The other kind of compliment, spelled with an E. Thank you, my dear. And, um, and that is that we fill in each other's gaps. So, for example, uh, last night Ruth and I went to the Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra for a, um, a concert that they did there where they did um, uh, Brahms and Sibelius. And uh, I got out my seldom worn uh, formal clothes for that and had to remember which clothing complements which clothing. And so that oftentimes takes the form of me coming out to my wife and daughter and saying, does this go with this? And do these pants work with that? And, and, if, and if they're doing this, then I just, I say, well, why don't you just pick for me then and I'll wear whatever you put out. But the, see, that's how we complement each other. I'm not that great on color coordination. The women in my family are because we men believe that there are only five colors and none of them are named for fruits. And, uh, and, and a lot of times women have that figured out. So we complement each, each other. This, uh, this uh, book, the book of Ruth, is going to complement what we just went through in the book of Matthew. So we saw the teachings of Jesus Christ over a period of about two, well, we taught in it almost as long as Jesus' ministry was. So two years and eight months to go through the book of Matthew, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because that's how we do it here at Calvary Chapel. And now we're going to go back into the Old Testament, but we're still going to see Jesus in the Old Testament. I don't know if anybody has shared this with you before, or maybe you discovered it for yourself, but Jesus does not begin in Matthew and end in Revelation. Jesus is through all 66 books of the Bible from Genesis through Revelation. And specifically, there is a concept that some teachers came up with called the scarlet thread. Have you ever heard of that? The scarlet thread. And that is this, that when Joshua went to fight against Jericho, he sent spies in first, and they met, with, uh, they met up with a, a harlot in there named Rahab or Rahab. And they made an arrangement with her. She wanted to be saved from the, from the uh, onslaught of the Hebrews, of the Jews. And so she asked to be rescued. And they said, sure, we can do that. Here's what you do. You hang a scarlet cord out your window, and we will know, don't attack the woman in that apartment. Uh, 
from your apartment on the wall. And so that scarlet thread, that scarlet cord hung from her window was representative of the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. And the fact that it was a long cord, like a rope, um, talks, it speaks to us that Jesus is, is woven like a cord through the tapestry of the entire scriptures. And so now that we understand that, we know to look for Jesus in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, and so on through the rest of the Old Testament. We will see this, uh, in this study the scarlet thread exemplified, and we'll be referring frequently to the New Testament and to the life of Jesus. Now, if you would rise with me, if you're able to, and turn to the book of Ruth, that is, uh, that goes like this, Josh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. So turn to Ruth, please. And Ruth, chapter 1. The book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malan and Kilion also died, so the, wo the woman survived her two sons and her husband. And then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb? that they may be your husbands. Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I, should have, if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear, two son, uh, also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. 
Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Lord God, we thank you for, for preserving this record of this story of, this account of, Ruth. And we're going to see also about a great man named Boaz. This is the account of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. Lord God, we ask you to teach us in these coming weeks about godly character and becoming a man of God or a woman of God. We ask you, God, to teach us about the interaction of male and female together and how that they can begin a household with a positive effect for the kingdom of Christ, Lord. We ask you to make us open to these teachings and not to cling to any faulty ways of the past, but Lord, may we have teachable hearts. Lord, we also pray today for those of us who are sick and cannot be here today. And we ask that the, this message also would go out over the internet or the podcasts and that they would be blessed by hearing from you. And we ask your Holy Spirit not just to be here in this place, but to be with them as they listen at home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please have a seat. Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel of Leesburg. This is November the 7th, the year of our Lord, 2021. We have just read Ruth chapter 1. The, this uh, message today will be the introduction to the book of Ruth. So to do that introduction, we're going to look at the context today, the cultural context that, uh, that this book takes place in. And to do that, I'm going to ask uh, a, f a friend of mine, Ivan, to come on up here. And he's going to help us to understand the context of the book of Ruth. Now, the first verse of Ruth, thanks, Ivan. Have us just stand right there for a minute, if you would. Um, now, in the, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Did you catch that very first sentence? It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Your version may say, when the judges judged. Kind of a tautology going there. This is different than when the kings ruled. It's a period before the age of kings in Israel. And it's, it's quite different than the age of kings. We may, we may make judgments, or we may hear some scholars say, yeah, it was really bad during the time of the judges, but boy, when those kings came in, they really cleaned up society. Well, hold on there. Maybe not so fast. It was a rough time during the period of judges, and the, I'm going to just read the last two, a couple of verses of the book of Judges, as, uh, and then we'll go back and have... Uh, have Ivan read from Judges chapter 2 to set up what it looked like during the period of Judges. But uh, as I read before, the order of the first eight books of the Bible go with the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is the, this is the period of time uh, between the creation and uh, the exodus and the law giving by God, Deuteronomy means the second law giving, and this all happened before the conquest of the promised land, before Joshua 
led the Jewish people over the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. So then comes the book of Joshua, and that's the account of the conquest of the Promised Land of Canaan. The idea there was this. The Lord said, I'm giving you this land. However, it's already, it, it may be flowing with milk and honey, but it's also full of Canaanites and bad people. I want you to wipe out every one of them and go in there, drive them out, and take over the land for yourselves. You're going to get farms that you didn't build. You're going to get houses that you didn't construct. You're going to get vines that you didn't plant. And this is, he's saying, in essence, this is my, the Lord's judgment upon these pagan peoples. I'm going to use you to drive them out. Now, history would have taken an entirely different path if the Jews had actually gone in and did what, what God told them to do. But they did not. They sort of made a peace pact with the devil. They went in and they sort of kind of started driving them out. But they were, they were a bit lazy and they never did it completely. And so they were always beset on all sides of them with a pagan culture. They always lived among the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the Ammonites. And they always had the God, the gods of those people uh, always uh, before them. So you had the Canaanites practicing their pagan religion in and amongst the Jews. In this, then in the setting of that, then Joshua went in uh, uh, Joshua s tried to lead the conquest. The people wouldn't follow him completely. Then Joshua died, and what comes after Joshua? He was kind of the ruler, right? Then comes the period of the judges. So this period of the judges goes from after the death of Joshua to um, just at the time of the coronation of King Saul several hundred years later. Um, Ivan, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and read, and if you all would turn to Judges chapter 2. Ivan will read Judges chapter 2 for us. And as you listen to this, listen to the context of paganism, of idolatry, of disobedience uh, that the Jews did not, did not drive out the surrounding peoples, and they did not uh, uh, squash the worship of these pagan gods. Go ahead, Ivan. I'll be reading from King James. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Harris, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the, on the north side of the hill Gosh. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them. And they were greatly distressed. 
Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went to whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant which I commanded their fathers and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out, from, drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein, as their fathers did keep it, or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, ne neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Thank you. Did you catch that? that go ahead and stay up here for a minute, Ivan. Did you catch that, that... Uh, that there was this cycle. There's this endless cycle of the people go whoring after other gods. God disciplines them. And he sells them into bondage to other nations. He puts them under the persecution of other nations, attacking, invading armies that come in and attack Israel and, and uh, victimize them for a period of years. And then God then the people cry out to, to God, Oh God, save us from these people. They are as locusts among us. And they steal everything from us and they eat from our substance. And then the Lord hears their voice and he raises up what's called a judge uh, to, to not only to judge them, but to fight against their enemies for them. And that judge becomes a savior to them. He saves their nation. We're going to get into a lot of foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who was the savior in this book and and then they they enjoy a period of prosperity and peace and generally that time of prosperity peace the Bible calls it quiet during that time of quiet it's about anywhere from twice as long as the period of, of oppression to about eight times as long as the period of oppression and so they enjoy more quiet than they have persecution. But then as soon as that judge dies and turns their back on them, they go whoring after other nations and other gods again. And so the cycle begins again. And this brings up the cycle that you may have heard of, that hard times make strong men. Strong men make good times. Good times make soft men. Soft men make hard times. And this cycle keeps going like that. I'm going to jump into uh, Judges chapter 3, to, and I'm going to read this to um, show the beginning of this time which, which the book of Ruth is characterized by. Now these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. You see that? The reason is he left the nations there. Why? To test Israel. That he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it namely five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites who dwelt in, the Mount, in Mount Lebanon from, from Mount Baal, Hermon, to the entrance of Hamath, and so on, that he, all those that he left, that he might test them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the test is two things. I want to test the men by challenging that they need to always be surrounded by enemies so that they can not become soft men because soft men create bad times. You may look around your society today and say this nation is full of soft men. 
and that's why we have bad times. And I think you would not be far from the truth in that case. And so uh, I wanted to add that as a, as a part of our, our ministry here at Calvary Chapel, I have encouraged all of us to go and to find people into whom we can build. And that would be um, unbelievers that we can bring to the Lord or, or younger believers that we can build up in the Lord. So Ivan and I meet every Sunday after church. And we go through a book called Future Men. And it's a book about becoming a man of God. And it's not a prissy book. It's not, uh, it's not all gentle and, and sweet and unicorns and clovers and things like that. Men need to do manly things. So we talk about doing manly things. So in my training of my children at home, uh, I've taught all my children, all nine of them, the boys and the girls, that, that we need to be strong and not give in to pressure from others, and that we stand up and that all of our lives we will always be swimming upstream as believers, always going against the culture as believers. And I teach the young men especially that we have a, a role given to us by God to be protectors and providers, protectors and providers. Also, we as the man of the house are the, are the priest of the home. We bring the way of salvation to our children and we teach them diligently these ways. According to Deuteronomy chapter 6, you shall teach these things diligently to your children. You shall speak of them when you rise up in the morning and when you go forth during the day and when you lay down at night. And you shall write these things upon the lintels, upon the doorposts of your home. Our homes should be scattered with scripture everywhere. There should be scripture on the walls. There should be scripture on the welcome mat. When you come to our house, it says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so we teach young men and, and, and young women, but especially young men, we teach young men, we must be protectors. And part of that is this from J Judges chapter 3. He he left the tribes, the, uh, the pagan tribes there, that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generation of children of Israel might be taught to know war. On my way here to church this morning, just for uh, context, I have got on my phone and I pulled up the Pete Seeger, Pete Seeger singing that song, Down by the Riverside. I'm going to lay down my shield and sword down by the riverside. Ain't going to study that war no more. I ain't going to study war no more. Ain't going to study war no more. And then I thought, excuse me. The Bible says to study war. That's what men do. Men need to be tough. They need to stand up against the enemy. And we need to be those who can bear the sword or whatever the weapon is so that we might be protectors of our families, of our society, of our nation. And that goes from our daily walking around in town all the way to getting drafted by the military or serving in foreign wars. Uh, we need to be men who can pick up the sword. Uh, and who can also just identify danger and guide our families around the danger. It doesn't always have to involve violence. But as part of our uh, discussions, we talk, Ivan and I talk about basic things. And I've been training boys and men for many years. This is my, kind of my specialty of ministry. And that is this. One of the things that I teach boys and men is how to enter a room. That sounds pretty basic, doesn't it? There's a way that a man walks into a room. And it has to do with this. So Ivan, what is that way? When you enter a room, especially a strange room for the first time, what are those things that as a man you're looking for? Well, you want to, as you enter the room, you want to identify the entrances and exits in case you have to run from any threat. 
And you also want to identify who the most dangerous person in the room is. Perhaps it's you, which is ideal and that's the best thing. But if it's not, you want to identify who it is and befriend that person. Uh, should, God forbid, a threat arise, uh, you will be safer and your family. Um, because if you are not the most dangerous person or you're not friends with the most dangerous person, that could spell trouble for you and or your family. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that, Ivan. Thanks for sharing today. So that's what, that's what we train young men to do. You walk into a room, first thing you want to know is where's the exits, in case you need to guide people out from danger, and where's the entrances, so that you can understand through which door the threat will come if there's a threat. And immediately after that, we train young men to, to analyze the room in about three seconds or less. And most of us guys, we, we already do that. It's sort of instinctive. And every male that you look at, it's because it's 99% of the time it's males. It, you're looking and you're, think, and you're analyzing threat or no threat. Threat or not a threat. Threat or not a threat. And your brain just does that. Threat or not a threat. And you analyze the entire room in about three seconds. I see that this room has no threats, or, or I see you know, back over there, potential threat over there. And so when you enter the room as a man, you either want to be the most dangerous man in the room, or you want to know the most dangerous man in the room and be on his good side. Or you, if there's a dangerous man there that you think is not a good man, you need to know that too. Why? So that you can arrange the way that you conduct business in there so that you don't become a victim of that fellow, and so that you can protect other people, innocent people, from the threat in the room. And 99 times out of 100, that, that guy who's a potential threat, nothing ever happens. Nothing ever becomes of it. But we need to be ready for that. Didn't September 11th teach us that? It did. I remember after the, uh, the attacks on our country uh, at September 11th, and the the facts came out that these hijackers took over those airplanes with box cutters. They didn't have knives. They didn't have guns. They had box cutters. And that whole terrorist attack was caused by people who took over planes with box cutters. And there were, those planes were full of men who could have stood up and said, no. Not here, not now, not on my watch. But we were caught unawares, unless you were on United Flight 87, I think it's 87, where uh, Mr. Beamer and his friends took that plane down into the ground in a farmer's field in Pennsylvania. He was ready. He counted the cost ahead of time. And so at that time, I resolved that I, for myself, and everybody that I could ever have the opportunity to teach, uh, I would try to prepare them. Let's be ready. Count the cost ahead of time. Know what you're going to do ahead of time. Be that man who can walk into the room and size it up. And be that man who studies war, who knows war. Doesn't mean you have to practice war. Doesn't mean that we're violent people. I myself have never raised my hand to another human being in anger. Uh, but I know how to. And so should men. Now, in that context, we see at the very end of Judges, chapter 21, verses 24 and 25, so the children of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family, and they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. And in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And then that rolls straight into Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land. So this is, this is during the period of judges when everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now it's not necessarily an evil thing to do what is right in your own eyes. But given human nature, it almost always ends up that way. We're going to see in the book of Ruth that Boaz also did what was right in his own eyes. He didn't have a tyrannical government or chieftain breathing down his neck and pointing out and telling him what to do. 
we're going to see that Boaz was one of those men who did what was right in his own eyes, and he did it in a godly, disciplined way to the glory of God because, because Boaz had a code inside his heart that governed him. See, the best governance of men is this. When men have a code in their heart that guides them to do the right thing even when no one is watching. And that government governs best, which governs least. At least the government from outside. So there's two kinds of government. There's a government from inside a man, in his heart, and then if that fails, then that requires that there be governance from outside to force the man to do the right thing. The scripture says that the purpose of government is this, to punish evildoers and to reward the righteous. We've grown to think that it means uh, something else, to regulate how we live every aspect of our lives. Boaz and all the people back then did not have that. They didn't have anybody regulating their life. So it would be used for good or evil, much like the internet. The internet is an awesome tool for good and for righteousness and for, to advance the kingdom of God when used correctly. And when used incorrectly, it, it is the exact opposite. It's used to tear down people and to, and to tear down the... the, the the uh, shields of their hearts. So, what kind of judging did the judges do? Well, the judges, they had a charismatic character, typically. And it, we look at the, the period of judges, uh, depending on how you count who was a judge, there's anywhere from 12 to 15 judges. Depends on what you do with Abimelech and Samuel and Eli. But these judges... Would, they, would, they would actually judge people, according to, do, according to what they were told to do in Deuteronomy. If you had a case that was a hard case, and you couldn't judge it locally by your city council, you would take it to the judge of the land, that the Lord would raise up judges periodically. And even, well, Deborah, her, her style, she was a judge. She just went and sat under a tree. That's what she did. You know, the judge, you know, maybe there's a sign out front, the judge is in. You know, five cents. The judge is in, and she just sat there, and people brought their cases to her, and she ruled on their difficult cases. But all of these judges, in one way or another, they wound up also uh, liberating, saving Israel from foreign oppressors. It's amazing the uh, oppression that God would allow to happen, the persecution that God would allow to happen to a rebellious nation. It wasn't God's wrath. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't God wishing to crush Israel. It was God chastising the son that he loved. And that's what we as fathers and mothers do to our children. We don't crush, we don't seek to crush them, to break their spirit, to break their will. What we do is we chastise our children, because we love them. The, uh, we see in the book of uh, Judges, we uh, look at, I'm just going to look real quickly at the first judge. This tells us a lot. Judges chapter 3, verse 5, Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to the sons, and they served other gods. See, this all begins with intermarriage with pagan cultures. You take a pagan girl to, as a bride for your son, and then rather than the husband influencing the wife for Jehovah, it wound up always being the opposite, which was the wife would influence the husband to follow after Baal and Shemash and the Asherah. Verse 7, So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. This is a continual state of man. We're, we're, we tend to be faithful to God when we're under some pressure, and when the pressure comes off, then we revert back to what comes naturally. And what comes naturally? Idolatry, paganism, 
Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rish, Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. So there's eight years of oppression. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Uh, now we see that uh, Othniel uh, had, had married uh, Caleb's daughter. So they are not far removed from the conquest of the land, uh, of the promised land. And then the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. So these men and this one woman, Deborah, uh, had a, a large portion of the Holy Spirit that came to, to rest upon them. And so some people would say, some people describe it this way, they were very charismatic individuals. And that doesn't mean they had a brilliant pearly smile. It means that they were, they were greatly strengthened and, uh, and instigated by zeal for God, which was brought by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, because that's what you do. Why? Because he could. How, why could he? Because he had studied war as a youth. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his right hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land rest, had rest for 40 years, then Othniel died. Uh, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Guess what happens next? And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so it goes, and so it goes. And the more things change, the more things remain the same. In that context, then, we don't know which cycle this is, or which judge under which this book of Ruth happened, but it's one of them. It could be anywhere from, it could be anywhere from, I suppose, uh, Gideon to Samuel, a anywhere in between there. I did, I did try to do all the math on this, and if you, if you look at how many generations and how many years, and the fact that different judges actually served concurrently with each other, so there could be two or three judges serving at one time. If you add up the period of all, all 12 judges together, it comes to 410 years. But the math doesn't work out because that would have them predating Moses. And so that doesn't work that way. So they have to serve, some of them have to be serving at the same time together in different regions. We don't know who the judge was and it's obviously it's not important for us to know which judge judged when uh, Elimelech left Bethlehem, and which judge was judging when Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem? Then uh, the names of the man was Elimelech, the, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian, Ephrathites of Bethlehem. By the way, Eph Ephrathah and Bethlehem, often used in scripture interchangeably with each other. I suppose the idea of Ephrathites would generally mean uh, a son of Ephrathah, but Ephrathah and Bethlehem typically used interchangeably in scripture in Judah. Then they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Um, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So Elimelech flees uh, supposed uh, fa famine in the land. Okay, what is that famine? So famine is always caused by something, and it's not always drought. If we, if we look at uh, the depredations of the land of Midian as they came in and, and conquered the land uh, under the period of Judges, they, they're described in Judges as like locusts upon the land, and they're consuming all the produce of the land. Well, when you come in like locusts on the land, and you consume all the produce of the land, would that cause a famine? I suppose it would. And we see that when Samuel went to find, went to find, uh, or rather when the prophet went to find uh, Gideon, Gideon was actually threshing out wheat in the wine press, and we looked at wine presses back in the book of Exodus, and a wine press is actually a big, a big hollow spot. It's like a basement kind of a, a structure that you build down into the ground, down under ground level, 
so that uh, you throw in a bunch of grapes in there and you stomp them and then they, they flow down to a lower level and they, the juice comes out of pipe and into, and into barrels that way. But when you go down into a wine press, it's like stepping down into a basement and when you're down in there, nobody can see you from ground level. So what's, what's Gideon doing? He's, he's threshing out grain down there. Why? Why would he be doing that? So the, so the Philistines can't see him. He's hiding. He's harvesting grain so that the, the enemy can't see him. So that, that would be indicative of a famine. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. So they went to Moab because there was no famine over there, um, maybe presumably because they had a king who was successfully keeping out invaders versus, say, Israel, where the Lord was allowing in invaders to come in. And so while they were there, they took wives, these, uh, these sons did, they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and she was the wife of Kilian. And the name of the other was Ruth, and she was the wife of, of uh, Malan. And they dwelt there about 10 years. So after the marriage of Ruth and Orpah to Malan and Kilian, after that, they lived 10 years. And apparently, it seems to be here, were childless that whole time. Now, you might ask, what are the odds that two women marrying into the same family would both remain childless for 10 years, and I don't know what those odds are, and it doesn't tell us, so I guess we're not supposed to know. Then both Malan and Killian also died, and so then the woman survived her two sons and her husband. So now the woman, being Naomi, is this widow of Elimelech, and she's got two widows with her, and there are three women alone in a strange land. Now these two wives are not actually in a strange land, but they're in a pagan land. And so where does, where does it go? Well, first off, we want to remember that it was against the law to marry foreign wives. You weren't supposed to do it, according to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3. You shall not make marriages with them, nor shall you give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. So this was an act of disobedience by, by Elimelech to guide his sons into marrying foreign wives. We've seen before where uh, Isaac and Jacob went to their kin in a pagan land. They went to kin to make sure that they didn't marry foreign wives. And it, was, it would have been available to them somehow to finagle a Jewish wife to come and marry their sons, but they did not. So they were, we can see, we can presume that there was some influence of the surrounding pagan culture upon that family sufficient that they felt the freedom to, they just felt the liberty to go ahead and marry, have their sons marry foreign wives in direct contravention of the book of Deuteronomy. Now there was no direct prohibition on marrying a Moabitess. It didn't say Moabitess. Uh, here in Deuteronomy it talks about Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, or Hivites and Jebusites, but you get the idea. Don't marry the pagan. And the Moabitesses were pagans. Now, as long as we're in here, I'm going to go ahead and quickly deal with the, the conundrum that a lot of us feel. Now, you've read, the, you've read the end of the book of Ruth, and you see where Ruth is actually the great-grandmother of David, and she's a Moabitess, right? And in Deuteronomy chapter 23, the scripture says, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord even to the tenth, tenth generation None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. And that's, you know, we often hear the question, well, how is it that David could then enter the assembly of the Lord if he was the grandson, the great-grandson of a Moabite? And the, the answer that, that we can come up with, the only, the only one that we can come up with is this, that that scripture was understood to mean that the curse against Moab ran through the patrilineal line. It ran through the fathers, it ran through the males, not through the females. At the very least, we saw that Ruth uh, was not a pagan. She said, your people, she literally said, your people is my people, your God, my God. So she was a convert, a true convert to the Jewish faith. But if the curse does not go through the woman, then, then 
David was not a descendant of a male Moabite. He was a descendant of a female Moabite. So uh, just wanted to put that rabbit trail to rest there. And she arose with her daughters-in-law, verse 6, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited or attended to his people by giving them bread. Yay, finally some food back here. We can stop threshing out our grain in the wine presses. We can stop hiding all of our stuff. Uh, by the way, it, it is... Uh, it is possible, as I mentioned, to have a famine even when there's plenty of fertile soil, even when there's lots of rain. There's a, there was a great famine in the Ukraine many years ago called the Holodomor, Holodomor. And that was when the Soviet Russians decided that they would starve the Ukrainians to death. And the way that they did that was they made laws that the Ukrainians could, they would have to harvest all the grain. Ukraine is the breadbasket of that part of the world. It's very, very fertile. And they had great crops, but they had to harvest it and turn 100% of the grain over to the government. And they created laws against gleaning so that you couldn't even go back for the grain that had spilled from the trucks. You couldn't even go back to the stalks of grain that had fallen down and been trampled by oxen. If you did, if you got caught with that, the sentence was death. The sentence was death. And thereby, the Russians actually committed genocide against Ukrainians, killing over a million Ukrainians just by, just by decree of the law. And this is what was going on in Israel as well. We want your crops. We, you can't go out and glean in the fields, historians say, and if we catch you with any um, stored food, then we will take it from you, and presumably we will kill you then as well. But the Lord, apparently at this time then, had ended the famine. We can, we can understand from this then that it would have been also coincided with the end of any occupation by a foreign power that was taking the food away from them because there's bread there. There's bread aplenty. So it's not just prosperity, but it's peace and prosperity. By giving them bread, therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So Judah, that's that part of the southern part of Israel um, surrounding the area of Jerusalem, and just outside of there is Bethlehem, or Ephrathah. Can you see that there might be a connection here later? What else do we see come out of Bethlehem later? And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go and return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead, that is your dead husbands, and with me. And with that, I see that we are out of time. And we'll come back next week, and we'll see where does it go from here. I want to encourage everybody, when you go home today, read this, the, the four chapters of Ruth. It's very short. Read it for yourself. And ask yourself several questions as you go through the book of Ruth. And those questions would be along the lines of, where do I see teaching in here about godly character? Where do I see examples here about people doing the right thing even when no one is watching? And how can it, po ask yourself this, how can it possibly be that a land which is basically anarchy, now anarchy doesn't necessarily mean chaos, but chaos often results from anarchy, I'm going to switch to this. This should still go through the sound system, right? So in a land which is, uh, has a government whereby everybody does what is right in his own eyes, how is it that on this farm of Boaz, 
good, godly things are happening. Boaz had the freedom to do whatever was right in his own eyes. And the judges would interfere only when it became a national threat to the identity of the nation, to the, to the survival of the nation, or when somebody had brought a case to the ju judge that could not be taken care of in the local area. How is it that on this farm that you're going to see of Boaz, that there's peace, there's respect, there's obedience, apparently there's prosperity, there's lots of crops, and there's charity. Boaz is taking care of the poor. He's taking care of starving people, and he does it willingly, voluntarily. How is it that a man and woman will do the right thing even when they're not forced to? What conditions are necessary to make that happen? And I invite every, anybody who wants to give me a call this week and say, hey, 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 Ron, I just thought of that, and I have this idea. Great, I love that. I love that when you do that. The scripture says, share, good, share all good things with him who teaches. That's not just talking about money. It's also talking about, I discovered this really cool thing in scripture. Let me explain it to you. I'll tell you what, Bible teachers, we love to hear that when you dis discover something cool in scripture that the, that the Lord shows you. Ask yourself those questions and come back next week with those eyes and ha have a thought, have a hypothesis of, I think all of this stuff is possible because, and you fill in the blank. Lord God, I pray that you uh, be with us this week as we go out. Enable us, encourage us, give us the, not just the ability, we already have the ability, but give us the wisdom and the self-discipline to do the right thing even when no human being is watching, even in darkness, Lord God. We know that you are always watching, Lord God. So, our actions are never unnoticed by you. Help us, Lord, also, us men in the room, to do the right thing by our wives and our children and our grandchildren. Make us teachers and priests in our homes that we may bring the way of salvation to everybody in our house. And as women, as mothers, Lord God, we pray that the women, the mothers, the, 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 the childless, that every woman would be your maidservant, your handservant, Lord, doing your will, building your kingdom, using her God-given gifts of nurturing and a kind word and her inner strength to bring glory to you and to advance the, your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. All right, see you next week. Glad you came. I'm going to stick around as long as anybody wants to to talk.